Welcome to our first, um, I feel like this is our first like educational talk since, you know, the, the new year has started. It's been a little bit. But thank you all so much for joining us. If you're new to the challenge, welcome. Um, we hope that you're going to find today's talk informative. And we are very thankful to our sponsor, TechNu, who are the outdoor itch experts. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, their product later on, um, especially because we're going to be talking about things you could encounter during the springtime. So uh, just to get started, uh, I'm Philip. I'm Carla. And uh, we are the co-founders of the 52 Hike Challenge. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, today's agenda. We're going to talk about the 10 essentials, clothing and layering system, footwear, day packs, other essential items, uh, navigation tools, apps, flora and fauna, including, including poisonous plants and animal encounters, and of course, some general hiking tips. A quick little note, um, if you have questions, we will take them at the end, but you're more than welcome to add your questions to the chat box and we will definitely get back to you. All right, so let's talk about those 10 essentials. What are the 10 essentials? Uh, these are the things that you want to take with you all the time because you just never know. And the reason why they're called the 10 essentials is because each of, of those essential items um, is only used in that one particular element. For example, you can't use a knife to create a compass and, you know, uh, matches are definitely something that, you know, is unique for creating a, a fire. So let's go through those things. Uh, navigation, uh, that includes a map and compass. We recommend a paper, paper map, uh, although there are several apps out there, but uh, actually having a paper map and a compass is great because you never know when your digital device is going to die out. Uh, sun protection, uh, which includes sunglasses and sunscreen, uh, really important that you always put the uh, sunscreen on every 80 minutes when you're out there, even in a cloudy uh, environment. Uh, insulation, extra clothing. You never know when the weather's going to change. And uh, I always carry my rain jacket. So that's uh, one of my uh, essential items. Uh, illumination includes a headlamp or a flashlight. Uh, I always bring a headlamp. Uh, again, you never know how long you're going to be out there. And every once in a while, you know, we're out there a little bit longer than we expect. Uh, first aid supplies, uh, that would also include um, some bandages and, uh, you know, some uh, items uh, for blisters. So uh, those are some things that I always bring with me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about um, matches and fire, uh, that includes a uh, lighter or candles uh, because again in a very dire situation uh, we would actually resort to uh, creating a small fire to keep us warm uh, something we really don't want you to do out in the wilderness but again this is uh, in extreme uh, emergencies uh, repair kit and tools um, i always carry a leatherman with me and uh, it's a little micro one so it's a really nice one that fits inside my little pack uh, nutrition, extra food, um, again, you know, maybe an extra bar for you in case you're out there a little longer. Hydration, extra water, you never know, you could be out there a little longer. Um, and so, and then uh, also bring an emergency shelter like a tent, plastic tube that could include like a space blanket or a garbage bag, uh, whatever have you. That would keep you a little bit warmer or just again, again, if you're out there and it starts raining, uh, those are some items that you can bring. Okay, let's talk about clothing. So I want to share a little bit of these items because we are talking about spring hiking. And I wanted to show you some of the things that I might be inclined to wear during um, the springtime. So a shirt like this, which is wick, um, moisture wicking, is um, something that I usually go to. And I've recently actually started using this shirt here, which is um, a shirt that is very cooling, it's moisture wicking, and it's great for protecting you from the sun. So even though it's a long sleeve shirt, it is extremely um, breathable, super comfortable, super, super lightweight. Um, so these are some items that I've recently been using. I am a huge fan of these convertible pants. Um, now, obviously, when you're first starting out, try to pick whatever you have at home that is going to have um, moisture wicking properties. Um, and, you know, when you're first starting out, we are going to give you some tips. Um, as you continue on, I love these convertible pants because the more you keep getting outdoors, 
You're going to go to places that might be a little bit more remote. You might come across areas where you're walking a, a, like amongst brush and stuff like that and things and trails that are overgrown. And these pants will help to ensure that like you don't get cuts and stuff like that. So that's why I like these pants. Also, if I want to turn them into shorts, I can take the legs off. So I'm really a huge fan of like these uh, convertible pants. We also recommend wool socks. Um, we don't have like your underwear in here, but obviously like sports bra, your underwear, you want it to be moisture wicking. We like ex officio. Um, I have different um, sports bras. For example, right now I'm wearing these REI sports bras that you can get. They're like, I think they're like $30 or something like that. Um, but the main thing is to make sure that whatever you're wearing is not cotton, is moisture wicking, um, especially now that you're going to get into spring and summertime. Um, as Philip mentioned, you know, we always recommend having that layer that is going to protect you against the rain in case that did come, you know, that's going to keep you protected from wind. Um, in addition, if it's really cold, you can put that layer on it, it will keep you warm. So um, we, uh, feel free to ask any questions about clothing and stuff in the in the comments. Um, we'll come back to those later. I'm going to have Philip talk about some of his favorites. Yeah. So um, just very similarly, as Carla mentioned, I really like the zip off pants. I uh, have a pair from REI and uh, they're really nice because I can uh, they're quite breathable and I can um, take them off and I can undo the, uh, the leggings, uh, you know, convert them into shorts. Uh, the shirts are also pretty nice. I'm actually happy to wear a, uh, an REI shirt right now. And um, underneath the, the pits, they're actually open, uh, like an open mesh. So it's very breathable. And some of them also have a, uh, an opening in the back. So again, uh, these are uh, both the pants and the shirts are, um, SPF 50. So they're uh, great for outdoors and uh, keep you nice and cool as well. Uh, I do also have the socks. Uh, I like the socks a lot. The, uh, as Carla mentioned, very similar pair here. Uh, usually I like a merino wool. It's a much better wool, much better than regular wool. And uh, one of the other things I do recommend when you do pick out your jacket to get pit zips. Um, pit zips are great. Uh, again, when you're warm, you can undo the zips underneath the, your pits and they can um, just breathe and you can, you can allow yourself to ventilate that way. I added a photo of a, a sweater, um, which is a fleece sweater, and those are really great to wear on top of your, um, your base layers. And that will definitely keep you warm. And then you can wear your rain jacket on top. Or, you know, if you're really cold, you can have, there's different types of jackets out there. There's so many different options, but this is a good kind of like entry level. Usually fleece is not super expensive. And if it did get wet, it, it actually, um, you can dry it out much quicker than, than other types of materials. Um, someone wanted to know about socks and what we recommend for spring um, socks or, you know, summertime. And I think Darn Tough has a pretty good amount of different types of socks that you can look at um, that I, I like wearing during the summertime, during springtime, fall. In the wintertime, I like a thicker sock. So that's when we're going to go with something like what we've shown you here. Yeah, in general, merino wool is a pretty pretty nice one. It's good. It's versatile for um, summertime as well as in the uh, winter as well. And one of the things that um, maybe uh, Carla mentioned, but uh, it's when these items like the, the wool or the polypropylene, when it does get wet, it, it still will keep you warm versus something like cotton where you're going to be cold. It's uh, again, these are moisture wicking, so they're all good. It's all good to sweat in them and still stay warm. Uh, and also, um, you know, as we we're talking about putting them all together, that creates that nice layering system. So it's way better to actually layer than to actually carry a heavy, heavy jacket. And uh, you can achieve that same kind of uh, warmth with the layers and you can uh, mix and match and take things on and off. It's really nice when you have the layers. Okay, um, let's move into footwear. Uh, so we have some uh, different uh, assortments of uh, footwear here. Uh, the uh, one on the top right uh, is the uh, uh, Arete. Uh, I actually wear that one quite often and uh, kind of like it, it's a light hiker. 
Um, these are, uh, in general, I, I tend to like more of a light hiker or a trail runner type of shoe than a full on boot. And, uh, the, the full on boot is great when you're, you know, having a backpack or your backpack is about 30 pounds. Uh, so it gives you more of that ankle stability, but, uh, a light hiker or a trail runner, or maybe even, a um, you know, a, a mid, uh, boot would be, uh, uh, in my preference, much more enjoyable. They're a little lighter, a little more versatile. And so I was going to say that in regards to the low uh, hiking boot there, the thing you want to look for in your footwear is you want to look for good traction because you're going to be going on different types of, um, you know, uh, terrain. So you might encounter rocks, you might encounter some, um, um, sorry, I'm thinking about sand, you know, it's just, there's so much different terrain out there. So what we see in, when we see a lot of beginners is that they're wearing shoes that have no tread and they're like slick. So what happens is, is as you're going downhill, people tend to start slipping. So good traction will actually prevent you from having that issue. Um, and then just another quick note, you know, good socks and good shoes, really important to really prevent blisters. Sometimes you can't prevent blitz, blisters and that's why it's important to carry that emergency kit. Make sure to treat those blisters. As soon as you start feeling that hot, hot spot, make sure to grab some tape. Philip always carries yeah. that hot spot tape. Really important to, um, to just make sure that your sh shoes fit well, but you also have a little space so your feet yeah. are not hitting the front of the, the shoe when you're going downhill. Yeah, so I'll give you a quick tip on this one. When you're sizing your uh, footwear, uh, definitely bring the right socks that you're going to bring, that you're going to be wearing with those uh, boots or footwear. And um, when you get into the store, uh, you don't want any more than about a quarter inch heel lift. Um, so that, because if you have more than that, you're going to get a blister in the back of your heel. And you also want to tap with your shoe on, you're going to tap with your toes and make sure that your toes are not hitting the front. Okay. So those are two things that you really want to look for. Of course, um, you know, if you go into like a, like an REI or a store that, uh, has a sophisticated measuring equipment, they have a, what's called a Brannock device and they can actually measure your foot and tell you which one to get. All right. Okay, um, day packs. So as we're moving into the spring, uh, again, it depends on uh, the ge geographical area that you're in. If it's cold during the day and it's gonna get warmer, you're gonna want a bigger backpack to put all those extra layers. So here we have uh, two backpacks. We have a 40 liter on the left and we have a uh, flash 22 on the right. And uh, the 22 is great if you're in an area where you, you're, you don't have that many layers and you're just gonna put like maybe one jacket in there. And it's, it's really just big enough for like probably one jacket, your 10 essentials, uh, some water and some food. And um, you know, really that's about it. But the, the 40 or something a little bigger, maybe even a 30 liter would be, would be uh, just fine. Uh, the 40 liter is also uh, the pack that I use whenever I go into winter environments uh, where you have extra, extra clothes, like including gloves and, you know, um, different uh, items like balaclava and, you know, maybe a different beanie. Okay, uh, let's talk about some of the other things. Um, one of the other ones that I really, really like, I really like these, um, these poles, uh, trekking poles. They really save a lot of your, uh, they kind of help you in terms of your traction and uh, going uphill as well as going downhill. They really take a lot of the pressure off your knees. And so I would almost say in terms of, uh, for those who are beginners, uh, I would say sh good shoes and good trekking poles are kind of like my, uh, my go-tos. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. And then again, for those people who are a little bit newer, um, going from right to left, we have a, uh, this is more of like a Nalgene bottle. It's a kind of an indestructible, uh, almost indestructible, I should say, plastic. You can actually put like really hot water in there and they're great inside of a sleeping bag late at night. Um, and then moving over to this uh, blue one, this is a Camelback. Uh, it's a water reservoir. It allows you to drink the water on the fly 
where you're, um, if, so you don't have to stop and take out your, uh, your Nalgene and drink. You can just drink it from that hose. And, um, you know, we also recommend, you know, you just never know. You could, you know, we hope that no one gets lost, but every once in a while, you know, especially when you're new, it just happens. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're kind of getting acquainted with uh, maybe using the map for the first time. And, um, you know, you might, you might take a wrong turn, but uh, the spot should really be used in more of an emergency situation. There is the ability to track your hike and for you to send a uh, like breadcrumbs to people. Uh, you're able to send a message to people. You're, it's a preloaded message, but there are, are other devices like a Zolio device where you can actually use an app and then you can uh, send a text through satellite communication. But uh, the real big thing that this is for, it's a satellite communicator. It's for hitting that SOS button. And that would uh, you know, notify search and rescue to come get you if you're in a, ever in a dire situation. OK, uh, another one that we really like to uh, recommend for people, if you haven't heard about all trails, I would highly recommend that you download it. There is a free version where you can scroll through and look at different types of uh, trails near you. And, uh, and then the probably the better option is to actually splurge and get the pro version because the pro version is going to allow you to download a map and keep it on your phone, even when you don't have cell phone service. Now, again, you really need to know that um, you, you have to download these maps before you get uh, to the trail before you lose the reception. Okay. It's not a, it's not a satellite uh, device. So, um, so that's kind of a crucial thing. So, you know, when we're doing our, when we're doing the planning, we usually download the map ahead of time, make sure it's on the phone and then, uh, you know, take off from there. Uh, the pro version has some other, uh, really nice, um, you know, additives. And I, I know that like, for example, lifeline, not sure if you wanted to mention anything yeah, about that. I was going to make a mention. So recently on our um, YouTube page, I added a new video of how to use the app. And um, I actually went into detail about how to download the map. Um, for us, something we've learned and just a great tip for anyone else out there, we really have learned that if we don't kind of plan a couple of days before, like the day of, if we're like trying to find something, it just gets kind of you know, hard because we're like, we've already done that one, you know? So first off, like, I think one tip as we're talking about planning your hikes is try to give yourself like three days prior, if not, maybe the Monday, like the week before that Monday, try to start thinking about where you're going, go onto all trails, pick out your hike, download the map. So it's already on there. You don't have to worry about it. Um, do your research. And um, as I mentioned, if you go on our YouTube page, we have a the most recent version of our how to use all trails tutorial on there. So we talk about like lifeline where you can alert your loved ones. Hey, I'm going on the trail right now. And then when I, you know, when you're off the trail, you can let them know I'm back. So there's a lot that you can do with it. The main thing, as Philip said, is please download the maps before you leave. And um, if you are new, splurge the $30. It's for the year. It's worth it. They even have some other offerings where if you do like three years at a time or something like that, you can get even more discounts. Um, so highly recommend it. I definitely know once I learned how to use all trails, I felt so comfortable even going on my own on hikes and just planning things. Um, it just gave me this new uh, found sense of freedom once I learned how to use it. So the best way is get on your phone, test it out, and, and get comfortable, go take it on a local short hike. Yeah, and definitely plan ahead, as uh, Carla mentioned, because you you want to plan ahead to invite your friends or, you know, but uh, it, it can be, I would say, just in general, just for even advanced people, it takes a couple hours sometimes to really decide on which one you want to do. And, you know, you may want to check the weather, you may want to, you may want to look into logistics. And so uh, just, again, know that it, is something that you want to take time to plan ahead and uh, it'll be a much more enjoyable experience. Don't do it the same day. <laughs> okay, and uh, as I mentioned before in the 10 essentials about carrying a map, um, look for what's called the Tom Harrison map. And uh, you know you can pick this up again at your local retailer. And uh, 
it's it's that sometimes these maps are actually um waterproof and uh you know they're really nice so they're they're very durable you you'll have them for a very long time and uh highly recommend you start picking those up yeah we also recently picked up the national geographic map we went to death valley national park and i loved it because it really helped us to like find a ton of trails on there and it, they have updated maps and stuff but just also want to recommend that you get accustomed to like when you're going to do a bigger trip to go to the store or go online and get one of these types of maps and get familiar with like how you you know how you read those maps how you can see different um terrain um we're not going to go into navigation today but there's a lot of things to learn and um getting a map and and getting comfortable with using it would be a great place to start mm -hmm. All right, so because we're talking about spring today, we are going to talk a little bit about um, poisonous plants. So I know here where we live in Southern California, um, there are some trails nearby that are experiencing overgrowth. Like I'll, I'll, there's a, a trail called Black Star Canyon. A friend was looking into it and was like, there's so much you know, poison oak according to the reviews. And so we decided not to go um, at that point. But the good news is, is that there are options if you do come across poisonous plants. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about where these plants are. As you can see, these maps here were provided by TechNew and um, they actually show us where you might come across these different poisonous plants, poison ivy, oak, and sumac. So let's start with sumac. Um, it is found mainly on the East Coast, as you can see in the map here. And we'll, we are going to show you actually some pictures of the different plants. Um, poison ivy is found both on East and West Coast. Um, what you want to know about the poison ivy is that um, on the West Coast, it's mainly um, on the ground versus on the East Coast. It could be coming from up on top because it's a climbing vine for, and it's also a, a ground vine. So you got to be careful with that. Um, and then also the poison oak is on the west coast. So as you can see on the map in purple, it is going to be both ground and climbing. So take a photo of this just so that you have that information. We're going to give you a website where you can learn more, but this is really useful. Poison-ivy.org. So what makes plants poisonous? It's the urushal, which is the substance that causes the rash on the skin because basically the oil binds to your skin and that creates this rash. Um, the body is trying to fight off the rash and that's what creates that allergy. That's what creates you know, the redness and the blisters and all of that. Um, three out of four people have a response to this oil and um, this oil is found in all parts of the plant, the leaves, the vines, and the roots. And by the way, it's also around, even when the plant is dormant, like during the fall or the winter time, and if the plant looks like it's dead, that doesn't mean that you may not come in contact with it. Um, so this- or your, or your dog. Your dog, I was gonna I was gonna say that, that, you know, that's typically, I, I've heard a lot of people say, hey, my dog got into it, I didn't know. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so yeah, it obviously spreads easily and can, you know, it, it can stay potent for quite a bit of time. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about, here are some images from, you know, poison ivy. And as mentioned before, it grows throughout uh, North America and even in Canada. And um, it can be a shrub that is up to four feet tall, and it can be both on the ground or the climbing vine. So it looks, as you can see on the, well, my left here, it is green uh, in that image, but then during the fall, it starts changing colors. So you'll notice it has like a red, sometimes golden. You kind of can see red and green. Um, you can see this photo here, you can still see a little bit of green in it. So um, it has some berries, which are grayish white, uh, so just, you know, keep an eye out as you're hiking along. Sometimes whenever I've walked around brush and stuff, that's why I always recommend like long sleeves or we recommend long sleeves and pants to cover yourself up. I sometimes have used my trekking poles just to kind of like, if I'm not really sure, move plants um, and things like that. So next we have poison oak. So poison oak is found um, 
you know, mainly in like Washington, Oregon and California. So as mentioned more on the West Coast, um, it can grow in a shrub and usually it is a climbing vine. Um, and then you can see here that the leaflets are scalloped, edged, and they re uh, resemble the leaves of oak, which they can also turn bron bronze. Um, they can be bright green, yellow green, uh, reddish, depending on the season. Um, and then this one also has some white or tan berries. So again, you know, like they say, leaves of three, let them be just, you know, remembering that, looking at these pictures, you can go on to techlabs.inc or tech, sorry, techlabsinc.com. Um, there is a link on the bottom of this uh, presentation that will take you to look and see more pictures. But the best thing to do is know before you go and we're gonna talk more about that. And then the last one is poison sumac. And that one is going to be growing mainly on the uh, on the East Coast and in wet areas, okay? So swamps, um, areas that have water. So usually this, this uh, compound has a leaf with seven to 13 leaflets, okay? And then usually the top one is pointed out and then they're kind of coming out. So you could see um, there's the green one here and then the red one, which is mainly in the fall when it turns red. So this one also has some little white and gray berries. All right, so what happens? Like, how do I avoid it? Well, unfortunately, sometimes you just can't, you know, you, you didn't know, you come, come across it, like someone here has made a, a mention, um, their dog got into it. So, um, you know, the, the best thing you can do is if you come across the poison oak or poison ivy is to try to treat it right away. So um, making sure you have the right items with you on your hike, um, it's really important to know before you go, super important to, before you go on trail, do some research, find out what kind of flora and fauna you're going to encounter. And we're going to actually talk about that a little bit more in depth. Um, so that way, if you know, hey, there might be poison oak on this trail, you can at least carry the items that will help you once you've, you know, let's say come in contact with it. So if you come in contact into it, you're going to definitely want to treat it as soon as possible. And within eight hours, we're going to show you some different options. So um, as mentioned, um, we there is a tech new original, which you is like a um, kind of like a lotion. You put it on, you rub it, and then you wipe it off. Or if you have water, you can wipe it off. Uh, cool, rinse it off with cool water. And then now they just came out with these detox wipes. So all you do is grab the wipe, open it up. I actually have them right here. You open there, them there's up. There's a bunch in there. <laughs> there's a bunch in here. It actually has 12 towels. So you'll take the towel, you'll wipe yourself off, let it air dry. You're good. Um, so these items were, are going to be able to remove the oils from your skin, clothing, gear, and pets. Okay, so really important, like I said, if you come across it to just clean yourself off, make sure that you don't spread it. If you have the rash, you can actually use their scrub. We also have that. We carry these on all our hikes, especially when we've led hikes for um, 52 Hike Challenge, where we invite people out. We want to make sure that everyone is safe. So we always carry it with us. Um, so you wash yourself off like a, a scrub with water. You can use this one on your pets. Um, so main thing is to remove the oil so that it doesn't spread and then treat the symptoms. So um, they do have, Technu also has some other items here. We do have that. I've actually used it for sunburns, just so you know, wind burns whenever I've gone hiking. The Calagel. Calagel. So this is another way to treat the itch, the burning. And those are just some items for you guys to consider to carry in your your car if you're camping and in your um, in your backpack as well. So talking about what we said earlier, know before you go, like super important is to do your research. For us, we do research whether we're on all trails, we'll go online, we'll, we'll do some research and find out um, with the local park what kind of things we may encounter. You can pick up the phone and call the ranger station and just say, hey, I'm just curious what kind of flora and fauna will I possibly encounter? So one of the things that people are most afraid about when they're new to hiking is animals. And I think a lot of times too, it's, you know, family and friends. They're like, oh my gosh, like what if I encounter a bear or what if I encounter a snake or something? 
So we've been hiking for many years. And the thing about that is, is a lot of times, especially within your local hikes, most likely, you know, you're not going to encounter bears because but bears are like more remote. And for example, like in Yosemite and stuff like that, where we live, there are no bears. So that's number one. First, do your research. Where are you hiking? Right. And then find out what kind of animals. So where we live, yes, there are snakes and it's it's common to see them during the summertime. So what we do is we've done our research to find out what do we do if we see a snake? Um, and so really, you just want to leave it alone, give it its space. Usually it doesn't want anything to do with you. That's why we always say be aware, um, pay attention when you're out hiking. Um, we also put some little quotes here, you know, um, for example, in Yosemite, uh, we actually took this off of the National Park Service. Attacks are rare. No one has been killed or seriously injured by a black bear in Yosemite. Um, usually what you'll find in Yosemite is they come up if you have food left out. So um, you want to put away anything that smells. You don't want to leave food out for the bears to come yeah, up. They're called bear boxes. And exactly. uh, they're usually there. They usually have them at the campsites. Um, but if you're actually backpacking, which is a different topic, uh, you can actually get these uh, canisters to put your food in. And of course, you would put it further away from you than where you're sleeping, just in case a bear did come over. Yep. And I want to say that I've, you know, I have gone backpacking quite a bit and I have encountered bears as well. And, you know, usually when we've seen them, they've not been super close. And so really what you want to do is you want to, you know, turn away if you can, turn around um, just to be on the safe side. Um, usually like the ones I've encountered never again were they didn't want anything to do with us. Um, that's why trekking poles, let's say you were close to a bear, you want to startle it and, you know, put your, make yourself look as big as possible, yell, you know, shoe bear. Um, but really, like I said, you know, th that's where it's important to know where am I going to be hiking? What kind of animals am I going to encounter? And what do I do if I see them? Um, another quote here we have is from the Food and Drug Administration that there are um, the rattlesnakes usually avoid humans and, you know, with 10 to 15 deaths a year, that's a really low um, possibility of, of something like that happening. Um, and again, you know, as long as you're paying attention, usually I've seen them way ahead of me when I, when I, whenever I'm hiking. So yeah, yeah you want to leave them alone. Um, they see us as the like kind of like predators uh, and they want to leave and, uh, you know, don't throw rocks don't try to move it. Don't try to do anything with your trekking pole, you know, uh, near the snake. Just let it be back up a little bit. And they usually will go away. Yeah, we actually um, put some information here. We took, again, from National Park Service. And um, basically, there are two different types of bears. One is the brown and grizzly bear versus your black bear. And, um, and it does talk about how to protect yourself in case of an encounter or what to do. So um, we're not gonna go into super detail today about that because that's the part that we want you to take responsibility for yourself before you get out there is to do your research and to understand, hey, there are, let's say there are um, moose in this area. What do I need to do? You need to follow the instruction of the parks. Um, there are other organizations out there that have a, a wealth of knowledge and will give you the right guidance. And there's so many different potential encounters that we couldn't go through all of them today. But the main thing is, is understanding what kind of animals, what do I need to do? Brown versus black bear, the way you treat those two are completely different. Um, having and carrying bear spray is another um, side note that we wanted to mention. Yeah, and you can, uh, again, look up the area that um, may have a lot of bear activity. And uh, for example, up in like uh, Montana, uh, you know, a lot of people do wear, do carry uh, bear uh, pepper spray up there. It's pretty, pretty standard. Uh, but, you know, again, down in Southern California, not that big of a deal. So we did want to share with you just so you could see a little bit of a difference between a black bear versus a grizzly bear. And um, as you can see, they, they do look different. Um, and um, this is all part of your research that you should be doing before you head out on the trail, okay? So we wanted to give you some general tips 
um, especially if you're new, you know, trying to make sure that you stay on established trails, please don't use what's called a social trail. Those are trails that are not on marked maps, um, trails that people like, sometimes you'll see a switchback, you'll see a trail that was cut straight down the mountain that actually causes erosion. Um, so please try to stay on those established trails. Definitely, um, I know one of the most important things is to be in touch with your own intuition, you know, your surroundings, pay attention, you know, do your best not to have your earphones. If you want to listen, maybe on one ear, that's fine, or use, we, we use... Um, it's an air. open ear or bone conducting type of um, uh, speaker system. Yeah, uh, so. we use something called aftershocks. And, um, you know, that allows for you to hear uh, what's happening. So just make sure that you are aware. That's the number one thing you can do, you know, um, to protect yourself when you're on the trails. And if you don't feel, if something doesn't feel right, you can always come back to the trails. Um, so, you know, letting someone know, ideally when you're new, we want to recommend you go with someone, you know, whether it's your, your friends or family members or, you know, at, at least bringing, you know, um, having someone with you will make you feel a lot more comfortable. And, and then once you feel more comfortable, if you feel like going on your own, then, then that's fine. But having a plan, you yeah. know, and if you go to like a local, uh, park, um, they have a lot of docent led hikes. So, and it's, and they're great because they're usually not just leading the hike, but they're also pointing out some of the different, uh, flora that you're going to come across and, it's it's really informative. So and, and and of course group hikes are great because then you can meet other fellow people, fellow hikers in your neighborhood. And um, I think they're I think they're great. So check them out. Absolutely. Letting letting you know again using you know whether you use a um, little note and you leave it on for your spouse or your family members and say hey I'm going on this hike I'll be back at this time. You know just make sure that you take those steps to protect yourself. Um, and then obviously we talked a little bit about the GPS device. I mean, there's so many out there. There's um, the spot device, there's Garmin, there's, um, what was the one that we were just- Zolio. Zolio, which is a newer one we recently tested and was very cool. Um, so yeah, just having that because you're not always going to have reception. Um, but when you're first starting out, that was another tip I was going to give them is when you're first starting out, try to go to a more local, um, popular trail. You know, I know in the beginning, like, just so you can get used to what it feels like to even be out there. I think that's always like the biggest, scariest thing for people. Plus there's more people on the trail. So, you know, um, uh, depending on, you know, if you're afraid of, uh, you know, someone, maybe a, uh, either an animal or a bear or person attacking you, uh, which, which is a little bit rare. Uh, but you know, these are all, these are natural fears when you're new and, um, you know, again, going on to a more popular trail, uh, would be better. So definitely check that out. As we mentioned, uh, the, the researching is super important. Um, if you are not familiar, there are two um, organizations. One is called Leave No Trace, and the other one is Recreate Responsibly. So check those out. Uh, one of the seven principles of Leave No Trace is know before you go. I'm sorry, uh, that's Recreate Responsibly, know before you go, but Leave No Trace is to make sure to plan ahead and plan accordingly. So um, that is really important, you know, to make Make sure to um, do your due diligence. You know um, that that's one of the the most important things you can you can do for yourself. And also, like people have saved themselves um, from a trip of like getting to a trailhead that's closed, um, especially with things like fires happening. Sometimes trails are closed for a long time, and people don't know that. So, um, checking road conditions. We we're going to talk a little bit here about the weather. Making sure that you check the weather before the night before. Um, so that helps you to plan for your clothing, uh, how much water to bring. So we usually typically recommend bringing at least one liter for every three miles hiked. And depending on your own needs, depending on the weather, if it's hotter, you're going to need more water. So um, making sure to prepare your clothing and your gear appropriately. And then obviously we're huge proponents of taking more classes to learn more. Map and Compass, Wilderness uh, First Aid, um, REI has a ton of classes that you can go on there and learn a, a lot of different skills in the back country. Um, so really just want to make sure you guys are safe. So 
We have a we have time for questions, and I'm going to read some of the ones that we've received so far. Yeah, and I want to also uh, make a mention. Um, I know we're coming out of uh, winter, and uh, there may still be some snow on the trail. Um, you know, it's obviously you know more slippery when there's uh, snow if you don't have the right traction devices. And uh, one of the traction devices that I'm referring to. Uh, that I would that I would recommend is uh, micro spikes. So I like the micro spikes. They're actual like little spikes that you um, they usually have like some sort of stretchy material that you can put over the boot and over your shoe. They go on the bottom and then you wrap you kind of wrap it up and around like the toe area. And um, I like the spikes rather than the uh, the coils or like the yak tracks. Um, I just like the spikes because then you get, you get much better um, grip. And uh, it, and and if you're and if you're new, you shouldn't be doing anything you know really steep. Um, anything that's really steep uh, would require, or even glaciers would require, like crampons and uh, a lot more training on how to use. Uh, like ice action crampons, but uh, you know, again, if you're if you're new to hiking, you shouldn't be doing anything remotely close to that. Uh, there are actual classes on how to use ice action crampons uh, for those people who do want to get into mountaineering or or you know something more uh, extreme. So some little notes. Um, Kathy was saying she's found a lot of trails where she lived that she didn't even know about with all trails. And I agree with that. Um, I was not a hiker myself. So um, once I started using all trails, I was like, wow, there's so many, all, so many more trails. We, one misconception that I think we had before, or maybe we thought at some point in our time was like that we could only hike in national parks mm -hmm. and, you know, no, there's so many trails. Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely. Philip said, that there's maps from just about anywhere in the world, which is true. We have found hikes outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, when we we've been traveling and such. Yeah, and um, and for those of you who are uh, taking on the 50 to hike challenge, um, that you know, I would recommend that you find uh, a local trail that you're going to go to, and uh, you know, this is that trail that you would kind of get your you know your stress relief on. You you go out that's your that's your sacred place. Because, um, you know, trying to find a new trail all the time is challenging. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you just have your go to. And I know whenever I have just a few extra, you know, like if I just have like, for example, a two hour window, um, that's enough time for me to go to my local trail. I have a couple of local trails that I go to, you know, and I go for, I, I tend to like to go to trail run or sometimes we'll go out there for like just a nice uh, hike. And, um, you know, it's just enough time to go out and enjoy and come back and maybe even actually get a shower in. So <laughs> um, it's nice to have those kind of defaults. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. So Susan wanted to know, is it safe to hike alone? She's always hiked as a family. So Susan, yes, um, I, I feel safe usually hiking on my own. Um, I, I've been doing it for many, many years, but I didn't start hiking on my own until I was confident in my skills of learning. Number one, I would go to trails that are close by. Like I go hiking by myself, actually, this local trail here that Philip and I have. I go on it by myself all the time. So um, I feel completely comfortable because I know the trail by heart. Um, it's really close to my home. It's pretty popular. So there are people on the trail. So I know that knock on wood, anything ever happened, most likely I would encounter someone on that trail. So that's why we always say, if you're gonna hike alone, maybe go to something, a place that's a little bit more popular versus a place that's more remote out in the wild um, back country. So, yeah, yeah, you definitely want to get more familiar with hiking before going solo. And uh, ideally, it'd be great if you can actually go to that trail, maybe with people, uh, with friends, and then go solo at another time, rather than, you know, going solo at a brand new trail that you've never been to before, because then you have a lot more factors going on. Not only are you going to be anxious, uh, anxiously worried about, you know, uh, or I can imagine, you know, maybe a single female being out there, um, or a solo female, uh, be more concerned, but then, you know, you also have to worry about, you know, navigation, finding your way. And, uh, you know, if you get lost, that's just really going to increase your anxiety level. 
So in regards to maps, um, Tom, uh, sorry, Philip said um, that Tom Harrison maps are great. He carries the paper map, plus he has the app Avenza maps. Awesome. Um, I haven't actually checked that one out yet. That allows him to download the same Tom Harrison maps he's carrying. That's that's a great tip. Thank Thanks. you so much, Philip. Thank you, Philip. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, Philip was talking a little bit about Poodle Dog mm -hmm. Bush. And I don't know that um, yeah. people... Um, so, so just so you know, we did talk to Technu about that, or I've talked to them before. Um, they cannot um th their product is specific for poison oak ivy and sumac um that's not to say that the product won't work on poodle dog bush and also do some research so you can take a look at what that bush looks like it usually uh after fires it grows right. it's kind yeah. of tall and um yeah so um it's uh it's got an interesting smell to it as well and uh but uh, just like Carla mentioned and, and Philip mentioned, uh, it is after a burn zone area. So I always carry some technio with me. And of course, you know, if I, if I ever feel an itch or anything of that, I'm just going to put it right on, um, you know, regardless. Uh, why not? You know, I'm not going to, you know, second guess it and just say, oh, I think it's poodle dog and I'm not sure if it's going to work. I mean, I'm just going <laughs> to put it on, you know, and hopefully, hopefully I'm uh, going to be good after that. Kathy wanted to know if there was a tech new product that we could put on ahead of time in case you are going to come in contact. Mm -hmm. So I, there is not, but like I said, now that they have the little, um, the little wipes, yeah. I would actually just carry that. Like Philip said, carry the wipe in your bag and just be carefree and not worry about it. Okay. So Okay, so someone wanted to know about the different um, types of plants we talked about and where they're located. She said there is no mention in the of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So, um, so okay, so someone Terry wants to know about. So let's go back real quick just to review the the map here. So as you can see in the Midwest, there is, that, that's why I said take a photo of the map because I think it will help you. Um, going back to this, the you'll see there's some poison ivy, poison ivy and there is both, uh, actually it's mainly poison ivy, but it's there's a, two different versions of it. It's Western poison ivy and the uh, Eastern poison ivy. So make sure to look up which one is in your area so you know how to identify it that's why we were saying earlier um going and and doing that research beforehand is really important mm -hmm. hopefully that's helpful terry we'll leave this up for a little bit okay. yeah christopher was talking about checking with local law for what's allowed in your area that you're going to be i'm not really sure what he was re referring to um all right, so Philip wanted to just give a few pointers. He he said, you know, if you encounter a bear, um, you know, how to back up slowly, not turn your back, not run. You can uh, look at his comment here in the in the um, in the chat box mm -hmm. and on Facebook, and definitely has some great uh, tips there. Thank you so much, Philip. So Christopher said he had a little tip. He said, all trails on your web browser on your PC has a lot more trails on the uh, than on the phone app. He said they are under community maps. That's something new. Thank you, Christopher. Cool. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Christopher said he was talking about bear can, uh, bags and bear spray so um yeah so feel free to chime in any other quick little questions you might have especially if you're new to hiking we want to make sure you feel comfortable um like philip said i think the biggest the biggest thing we encountered was finding trails and feeling safe so looking at your local parks for those do docent led hikes um there are so many parks here we live in orange county uh, California, there's a lot of parks that lead hikes 
um, you know, Laguna, uh, Laguna Coast, um, they, they offer tons of docent led yeah. events, Irvine Conservancy Ranch. Um, so that's a great way. Meetup. Yeah. Meetup and, if you're, and if you're new to hiking, um, so uh, we found that uh, going on at something like five or six miles, uh, no more than a thousand feet gain is uh, really, uh, you know, it's a good challenge for those people who are brand new to hiking. Um, you know, so there is kind of a, a slope to that. So, you know, for example, if you see something that's three miles and 2000 foot gain, that's going to be really steep. Okay. Um, so you have to kind of think about the, the whole trail going out and back. Uh, so if you see like a four mile and it's out and back, uh, it's really two miles up and two miles back. So think of that as you're making your plans. Uh, but uh, we found that uh, most people, if you stick to about, you know, um, three, four, five miles uh, as, a, as a beginner, again, under a thousand feet, um, you know, you'll be, you'll be in pretty good shape. And, um, you know, and then you build up uh, to those bigger hikes by increasing by about 10% um, each week. So that's kind of a, a general rule. We have a few little tips from the community, which I love sharing. Um, Susan said that a rubber collapsible water bowl for your dog is great, totally. Make sure that you just make sure to check that the trail is um, actually allows dogs um, before you get out there and please pack it in, pack it out. So get comfortable, learn the seven um, leave no trace principles. Mm -hmm. And um, someone said, Kathy said she just joined the challenge. She found the 10 essentials very useful to be prepared. Thank you. You're welcome. Blake, for satellite watches, I think you mentioned how do you use those effectively with hikes for GPS? This is your favorite <laughs> topic. Well, um, I, I really like the Garmin uh, Phoenix watch. And uh, the one that I currently have is the uh, 5X, but there's a newer version out. And the, uh, the, the one that has the X on the back, uh, I think the 6X or 5X, um, those usually have some preloaded maps. And uh, there's a whole tutorial on how to download and, and import in uh, those GPX files. But uh, one of the things that I absolutely love about having that watch is it leaves what's called a breadcrumb trail. And so what that does is it just leaves a little dot every maybe, I want to say every 30 or 40 feet. And um, that way I, I can hit track back and I can go back the same way I came. And it's, it's really nice because then I, I feel like, uh, again, of course, I'm still going to bring a map, but, you know, it just gives me that peace of mind that, um, you know, I have something that's tracking me and I know how to get back. Yeah, I mean, we wrote a, a blog. If you go to our website, there's tons of resources, but we wrote a blog called How Not to Get Lost, essentially. Um, and there's so much, you know, there's so much. I mean, if you can always carry something that tracks you um, and don't forget to bring your, you know, a, a extra battery pack too, if you're going to be using your phone for, you know, tracking you and stuff like that, just because that way you can track back. All Trails also has that option. But there's like, there's almost like, hike maps, you know, course, because um, there, you can actually also upload GPS tracks, GPX tracks into all trails as well. So there's like a lot of different ways. And I myself have had a watch where I can upload GPX files. And that kind of goes into like, once you've gotten really comfortable with getting onto the trails, and now you want to start doing some, some things that are a little bit more remote. Um, so there's just so much to learn. And that's what I love about, you know, hiking is that it's a constantly evolving situation where, you know, you, now you're hiking and then next you want to do backpacking and there's so many opportunities to explore the outdoors. It really does open up the gates to, um, to really exploring. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know, I know we didn't cover everything here and there's still, uh, as Carla was mentioning, there's always, uh, something to learn. Again, um, there's more stuff in terms of our, um, you know, in terms of winter hiking and all that stuff. So, um, you know, stay tuned. We, uh, we're always putting on these events and we also have a lot of other videos on YouTube as well. 
I, um, if anyone has any other questions, um, let us know now. Thank you all so much for your sweet comments. And um, also just to let you know, you know, don't forget, we have a ton of resources on our website. We have hiking logs that you can download. Um, we have actually, if you don't know, we have local Facebook chapter pages. We have a catch all chapter page where people from all around the world are sharing their hikes. We have our Facebook, social media. Yeah, we have our social media pages, uh, Facebook and Instagram. So please follow us on there. We constantly have events. We now our leaders are leading hikes all around the U.S. I know in I want to say in May we have Ohio and Pennsylvania hikes going on. So just keep your eyes open. Keep checking our website for events, for talks, um, and please join your local local chapters and you know get involved. I mean, 52 Hike Challenge is really a community effort, um, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to share this with you all. Yeah, and you can find all those groups on the Facebook page. Um, I, I believe it's under groups. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. So. If you just go to that page, you'll be able to find some different groups in your area. And uh, and if there's anybody also watching that happens to be advanced and would like to become a, a group leader, uh, please let us know. Yes, please do. Um, real quick side note, Judith Ann said, what kind of snacks do we like to take with us on hikes? Um, I usually like, uh, I take clip bars usually, um, but then I also take a couple other things. I kind of been making my own little energy balls with uh, peanut butter or actually almond butter and uh, some cacao nibs and overnight, uh, oats. overnight oats. So those, those have been fun and chia seeds. So those are really nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, I tend to, tend to like the bars. I think we pick some other trail mix up as well. Trail mix is like a must for mm -hmm. me. I definitely always bring trail mix and some sort of a bar for sure. I actually usually carry two bars, one in case like I need it for the energy mm -hmm. and then I'll have nuts. Also, if you are doing longer, especially at the advanced people, um, I typically like to bring some sort of an energy gel, a chew. Sometimes I use honey stinger. Don't forget your electrolytes because mm -hmm. if you're out in the sun, you want to replenish the sun. Uh, I'm sorry, replenish the salts. So that's another tip for sure to bring. And then obviously your lunch, if you're going to be out for a day hike, I love bringing like a, we do peanut butter and um, mm -hmm. peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. With we banana. Do with banana. <laughs> and we do um, turkey sandwiches or, you know, uh, avocado sandwich, things like that um, to make sure that you have, but just always make sure to carry enough snacks because if you start bonking out, you'll need that extra energy. You'll need something with a little sugar in it. Yeah. And uh, also remember um, to still hydrate afterwards after your hike. So if you um, maybe didn't drink all your water or uh, drink your electrolytes, like a Gatorade, um, continue doing that. And uh, especially if it's a long hike or it's been a hot hike, uh, you definitely want to make sure that you've uh, finished all that water that you should have drank on the hike. Yeah. And I'll just add this last little tip pre prehydrate as well, because when I first started out hiking, I would get dehydrated and I would get headaches. And I actually thought hiking gave me headaches, but I found out I was actually dehydrated. Yeah. So I was already going out on the trail being pre-dehydrated, then I was sweating and then I would get the headaches and I would feel really tired. It, I just didn't have enough water in my system. So please pre-hydrate, hydrate on the hike, yeah. post-hydrate. Yeah, and you can do, um, you know, you can also have, of course, apples and some fruits, uh, you know, that contain a lot more water weight. And uh, those are also excellent sources of, um, you know, fuel, but uh, also it's gonna provide that, uh, that hydration as well. Well, thank you all so much. We will um, share this recording on YouTube and we look forward to catching you all on another event. Please let your friends know about us. You can visit us at 52hikechallenge.com. Thank you to everyone who chimed in on the chat box here on Facebook. We really appreciate you all. Have a wonderful rest of your evening.